Church Familia uh, in person. So good to see your smiling faces, all of you who are online at home. I'm Eric. I'm one of the pastors here. And I just have to tell you, you look good. All right? <laughs> you look good. I, I've been sensing a, a spirit of freedom over these past few weeks that we've been in this series called Locally Grown. And I'm telling you, growth looks good on you guys. And so as we begin today, I want to share a story, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm sure all of you remember last spring, uh, many of us, if not all of us, were quarantined in our homes. And first of all, shout out to all the teachers, all the educators, everyone who works in the school. We love you. Today, we're going to take some time to pray specifically for you. Uh, we know it's not easy with everything constantly, seemingly being changed. But uh, last year, um, I had to be a teacher during the quarantine, and uh, I couldn't do it. And so, perfect place for imperfect people, yes? I just decided one day in the spring that I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Kids, I'm doing your homework. I don't care. <laughs> All right? And we're skipping school this week. Close the laptops. Let's just go outside. And we had a fun, adventurous week. And while we were playing outside and just getting some sun and, and me not losing my mind or my patience because I don't know how to teach my children, my little toddlers, how to, how to, how to like do math and all that stuff. As we were in the backyard one day, I saw a tree in my backyard that I hadn't noticed before. Now, I knew how it got there. It was planted four year, uh, well, way more than four years prior. But when we moved into that house four years prior to that, I chopped it down. But now all of a sudden, it's like it's growing back. When did that happen? How did that happen? I thought I got rid of it. And so I'm looking at this little tree as we're playing in the backyard, and, and I see fruit growing from it. So I call the kids over. I said, kids, look at this. It was a banana tree growing in my backyard, and it produced fruit. And so I grabbed the bananas, and I peeled one of them, a little small little bananas, and I ate it. And I'm not exaggerating. This is not for the sake of the sermon. It was the best tasting banana I had ever had. If you've never had a wild, organically grown piece of fruit before, I'm telling you, you're, you're missing out. Miss Chiquita, she could not produce bananas as good as this one. It was so delicious, and I did nothing to cause that to grow. In fact, I did the opposite. I, I chopped that tree down. But I want you to hear this. Because I'm not a farmer and I didn't go down to the roots, because it still had roots, it grew. And it took some time, but it produced good fruit. I don't want you to be discouraged this morning. I know that some of us aren't who we want ourselves to be in this moment. Some of us, we beat ourselves up because the fruit that we thought should be in our lives by now is not being produced. I don't want you to be discouraged. You may not be where you want to be right now, but can we thank God that we're still growing? Amen? That the foolish decisions that we made last year, we're not making anymore. And we may still be struggling with some sin, but Jesus has transformed us and we're no longer the people that we used to be six months, six years, 15 years ago. God is still growing us and I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for the hope that we have. And that's one of our values here at the local church. Again, you see it. You see it posted. You see it on the flags on our light post. We say that hope happens here. That there's hope found in this place. And not just in this place, because the church isn't brick and mortar. It's not a building. It's flesh and blood. It's a people. When the people of God are together and when the people of God are dispersed, we are bringers of hope. Meaning, we can be all that God wants us to be, no matter who we used to be. When we say hope happens here, we mean that we can be all that God wants us to be. Everything that he desired and designed us to be, no matter who we used to be. And this growth, this fruit that we're talking about, it's not like Krispy Kreme, okay? It's not hot and ready right now. Sometimes it takes some time to develop. But God is growing us. God is developing it naturally in us as we learn to lean into his spirit. So the first big idea I want you to get is this. God will grow in you what he wants in you if you will rest. Say rest. 
If we rest, that means I, I'm just going to relax in the work that has already been done. If we learn to rest and rely, say rely. Rely on his spirit. Jesus, you've done everything necessary, and so I'm going to rest in you. And I'm going to rely on your spirit to be all that you want me to be from this day forward. And this fruit that we're talking about is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. This is the passage that, that we've built this whole uh, theme of locally grown around. Here's what it says, Galatians 5, 22. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. What we're talking about today Kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and its desires. Those of us who, who belong to Jesus were saying, I'm not my own, I've been bought at a price, and so I'm going to do my best to, to, to crucify all of my desires so I can follow his will. But then we get this challenge and this promise in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit... Since we've been made alive by the Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us and has raised us into new life. If we live by the Spirit, here's a challenge. Let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us learn to rest in what he's done to save us and rely on his power to grow us. That's what this is all about. This is how we get good fruit that is locally grown. And so today, I want to talk about kindness and goodness. Last week was a difficult week. We talked about patience and peace. And some of us, we didn't have peace in our lives because we didn't have patience for other people. And so if, if patience is, is a tough fruit, kindness is more of a tender fruit. And, and it's, it's no surprise, it's no coincidence that, that they are right next to each other. Because both of those are primary characteristics of the first fruit, which is love. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we see kindness and patience together. It says that love is patient and love is kind. And, and that's so true. Love is patient. Love is kind. When we love someone, it makes it easier to be patient with them. If we love someone, we don't show impatience nearly as much as we do to people that we don't even like, right? It's, it's, a, it's a characteristic, a quality of love, patience is. Kindness also is a quality of this fruit of love. One of the greatest descriptors and characteristics that we see in people that are loving is kindness. And so when I think of kindness, when I think of, of, of someone who that is just who they are, they give a smile, they give an encouragement, they always have something positive to say. Uh, I, I, I thought long and hard about this and I've been watching, well, I don't want to say that. Um, there's a show on Apple TV that is about a, a, a football coach who, who is now coaching soccer and um, there's some adult content in it, so I'm not, I'm going to stop talking about it right now. Uh, um, but but I, I, I've seen this show and it just makes me so happy. Like I have a smile on my face. I'm like, are these people real? Are there really people that all they do is encourage you and they coach you? And I'm like, yes. That's jo Johnny Butler. Dr. Johnny Butler. I love being around my friend, Dr. Johnny. He just is so encouraging all of the time. He speaks life. My, my, my patience with Johnny has no end. He gives me peace in my, because he loves me. And it's not because he's perfect. It's because he's kind. I remember the first time Johnny told me that he and his wife Tracy got in an argument. I'm like, no, there, there's no way, Johnny. You're just too kind. There's no way you got in an argument. And it gave me hope. I'm like, if Johnny and Tracy got in an argument, there's hope for me and Jessica. There's hope for imperfect people like us. But again, it's not because Johnny is perfect that he's just so loving to be around. It's because he's kind. So what is kindness? To be kind means to want to help to encourage or comfort others simply for the sake of it. 
There's no reward. In fact, the reward is simply doing it. That's what kindness is. In fact, the Greek word in the fruit of the spirit of kindness, it actually means, it's defined as goodness in action. Goodness being lived out. So then what is goodness? First of all, I want to tell us what goodness isn't as we continue. Write this down in your notes. Being good and having goodness are not the same. And that's important for us to note. Being good and having goodness are not the same. See, being good, it means the, the absence of, of, of defect or flaw and the presence of complete wholesomeness. That's what it means to be good. And Jesus says, only one person is good. Mark 10, 17 as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up to Jesus, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God. Now, Jesus wasn't denying his deity. He wasn't saying, I am not God. He was simply challenging this guy and challenging us today to, to understand what we mean when we say someone is good. What does that mean? God says only one is good. His word tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned. All of us have fallen short of his glorious standard of perfection, of goodness all the time. David said in Psalm 51, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. But culture tells us that everyone is born good. That we're all good-hearted people. But our environment and our experience, that's what helps turn someone from, from being good to better or turns them from good to bad. And while psychologically, that, that plays a big role. While your environment and your experience does play a part in who you become later on in life, the truth is still that doesn't matter if you had a good or negative experience growing up. All of us have the inclination to sin. And no one has to teach us how to do it. Some of you don't agree with that. Look at children. No one has to teach them to lie. Did you write all over our refrigerator? No. Who did it then? I don't know. Why is there a marker all over your hand and your face and your body then? I don't know. I didn't do it. It, it. it was Ethan. Like, no one had to teach little kids how to lie. No one has to teach kids to be selfish. What, what's their favorite word? Mine. No, no, no. I bought it. You don't have a job. You don't even mow the lawn, kid. That's mine. No, it's mine. It's what you can't have it. What, what do you mean? No one has to teach our kids to do wrong. No one has to teach our kids how to sin and bite. Now listen, perfect place for imperfect people. I have done some, some, uh, some things in front of my children that I will admit are not the best example. And they've learned some things from me. They, they, they've learned to be, you know, obsessive compulsive about the floor being clean. If it's not clean, hey, make sure you pick up everything. Like, so, so I get it. They, they have learned some, some negative uh, uh, responses and some negative examples for my example. But one thing I have never, ever done is when I don't get my way or I disagree with someone, I never resort to biting them. <laughs> it's never happened, Okay. When my wife and I, when we argue about things, she never gets, you know, team twilight on me and, and like, I'm just going to bite your neck. So my kids have learned that all on their own. No one had to teach them. It was in them. When I don't get my way, I bite people with my teeth. Now, my kids were born cute and, and, and most of us, all of us have been born cute, okay, to somebody. I'll just leave it at that. Someone thinks you're cute. <laughs> Come on, you know it's true. You know, some babies are like, Ugh. is that an alien? I don't know. But hey, mom and dad love them. All of us have been born cute, but, but none of us have been born good. Because to be good means to be like God. 
To be good means to be perfect in every single way. And we're not. None of us are born good. But I don't say that today to discourage us. There's hope that can be had today. Hope happens here. Here's where the hope begins. I want you to write this down. The beginning of being good starts when we become born again. We're not born good, but we can grow to be good. We can grow to look like Jesus. And that beginning of being good, it starts when we are born again. Meaning specifically, explicitly, when the Spirit of God comes inside of us and makes us alive because we've surrendered our life to to what Jesus has done. We've repented and we received his free gift of salvation. And when that happens, the Spirit of God comes inside of us and our nature changes. 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, therefore, if anyone is in Jesus, if they are in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Not upgraded, not learned from the past, but you are completely new. You have a new spiritual nature. You've passed from death to life. You've gone from not good to now carrying the goodness of God. Behold, the new has come. And God saves us not because we're good, but because he's good and he's kind. And now he's written his name in our hearts and he's filled us with his spirit and his spirit is the one who helps us to do good. Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. The spirit produces fruit inside of us and helps us now to do good. Good, And that's what goodness is. See, goodness isn't simply being good. It's a rare word in the Bible. When it talks about goodness and the fruit of the Spirit, it's a word that combines being good and doing good. Kindness is what? It's goodness in action. Goodness is what? It's being good and now doing something with that good. And I don't know if you've caught it today. I don't know if you've caught it over the past several weeks, but this fruit that we're talking about, this growth that God wants to develop naturally in us, even though it's in us, it's not for us. Even though it helps us, it's meant to bless other people. This is why he wants to develop this in us so that other people can be transformed. So write this down. Goodness is going out and doing good to others. That's what goodness is. It's going out. It's not staying stagnant. It's not staying in the four walls of the church. It's not staying in your Bible study. It's not staying just at your house and, and, and church. We, we don't need to be in the presence of other believers. We don't need to do anything. We're saved. That's all we need. No, it's going out and doing good to others. And we see this example in the disciples. And we see this lived out by Jesus. He is the essence of goodness and kindness. But what this is about is how do we grow that within us? I want to share this this story that Jesus did. And I think a lot of us are familiar with this story. But as I was preparing and reading this a few weeks ago, something stood out that has never stood out before. And I believe this is the key for us to grow naturally in our kindness and our goodness. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. Here's what it says. Behold, a teacher, a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? How can I be saved forever? And Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your, uh, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. He understood Every good Jewish person knew this. This was the Shema. This was their declaration of God's goodness and their responsibility. But then he said this, and your neighbor as yourself. So he got it. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But him desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? 
Again, I think a lot of us were familiar with this story. And me, many times when I've read this, I've said, man, this guy, he, he is just looking for a loophole out of the, the life that God has called him to live. He's trying to figure out, okay, give me a checklist. Who should I love? Because I will love those only. But, but the more I read this and the more I, I hold up God's word as a mirror unto myself, I realize maybe this isn't a bad guy at all. Maybe this is a guy who's just realistic about the reality that it's hard to love people, right? Like he was a lawyer. He's had to defend a lot of really imperfect people. It's like, Jesus, who, who is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love as myself? Because some of these people I've represented, I, I know they were guilty. Do, do I need to love them? Some of these people that, that I'm defending against, they're terrible people. Do I need to love them? Who is my neighbor? Because it's really, really hard to love all people who are these specific people. And Jesus, he gives him the story. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. This man who we are led to believe that, that he is a Jew. He is one who, who, who wants to love the Lord, their God, with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he's beaten. And he's left for half dead. He's robbed. He's stripped. And by chance, a priest, a Jewish pastor comes by. Like, this is good news. Surely this priest, this pastor, is going to help someone in need, but he doesn't. He walks on. And then a Levite comes along. This was a very privileged people group. The rest of the 11 tribes gave to the Levites their wages. They were set apart to have a face-to-face -face audience with God on the inside of the veil in the tabernacle while the rest of the people, they had to hear from these Levites. You need to understand this is the most socially charged story Jesus has ever told. So this priest and this Levite, this pastor and this privileged group of people, they see this man in need and they walk on. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, and I like to believe that as everyone was listening to Jesus share this, they all gasped. <gasps> Samaritan? No, no, we don't like Samaritans. Samaritans were despised in that time. We know this story as what? The good Samaritan. But in that culture, in that time, to those people, to say good Samaritans like saying, that's a really nice Nazi over there. What a wonderful white supremacist they are. This is so great. They weren't simply marginalized, they were hated, they were despised. Jesus says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then set him up on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, but whatever more you spend, okay, this is not it. You make sure he's okay, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. And then in verse 36, Jesus asks a question. He says, which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor who fell among the robbers? This lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? And Jesus is saying, who proved to be the neighbor? Who was the one that was actually being neighborly? And the lawyer, he can't even say Samaritan. He says this, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says to him again, you go and do likewise. Now I want you to remember the original question. What was the lawyer's original question? How can I be saved? How can I have eternal life? It wasn't who do I go to? 
It's how can I earn eternal life? And Jesus, typical Jesus, he asked a question on a question. He says, well, what's your interpretation of the scriptures? And the guy says, love God with all of who you are and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you've answered rightly. Now go and do the same. And when Jesus said, go and do the same, and when Jesus finished sharing the story about the Samaritan and say, go and do the same, he's not saying, try to do the same. He's saying, literally, go and do that. Be loving, be kind all of the time. Be like the Samaritan and love all people, period, for all of time. Be perfect. That's what he meant when he said, go and do the same and you will be saved. Go and be perfect. Can we do that? Can we love all people all of the time? I can't. Kindness and goodness, I'll be honest with you. Like, it's, it's work for me to be kind and good to people that just annoy me a little bit, okay? Like, it's hard. But people who despise me, people who criticize people who hate me and want the worst for me, they're not even on my radar of being remotely kind or good to them. Now, I don't respond in kind. I don't write nasty emails back to them. I don't put them up on social media and and wish that their family moved somewhere else. I, I, I don't respond in kind, but what I do do is I ignore them. I forget about them. But Jesus said, go and do the same. And so maybe you're like me. Maybe you're imperfect. Maybe you have some growth that needs to happen in your kindness and goodness. And when we hear a sermon like this, and when we hear Jesus share this, oftentimes our response is, okay, go and do the same. Here's what we're going to do, church familia. We're going to go out and show intentional acts of kindness. You're going to pick up the phone today, and you're going to call someone who you've offended. You're going to pay it forward. We're just going to love people in our community. That's going to be our next sermon series. Love out loud. Lol. You thought it meant something else. No, we're going to be intentional about loving everybody. And that's good. And that's, that's noteworthy. And that's noble for us to want to go and do the same. And our response is when we hear this, let's go out and let's love people intentionally this week. Let's go and do the same. But if we were going and doing the same, you know what would happen? Our world would be changed. If everyone loved like the good Samaritan, we wouldn't be having these issues we have today, right? So are we going out and doing the same? Can we? How? How do we? I want to read what happens next. A lot of us, we don't bring these two stories together. But the next verse, literally, Luke, the Holy Spirit inspires him to go from this lawyer and go and do the same to the living room of Mary and Martha. And I think this shows us the key. Luke 10, 38. We know this. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, with much action, with much doing. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Martha is working. Martha is showing kindness and goodness to prepare a place of rest for Jesus. And Mary is doing nada, nothing, zero, zilch. In typical sibling rivalry, Martha is upset. She goes to the teacher. She says, Jesus, I'm doing all of this. My kindness is, is, is being lived out. 
I'm showing goodness to everyone in this house. But my sister, who should know better, is doing nada. Tell her to get up and help me. And Jesus' response is, no. No. The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. You're doing all this work and you're worried about who's looking and you're worried about the growth and and it's bringing you anxiety. And it's not that it's bad, but one thing is necessary. It's not that it's bad, it's you're not focusing on what's more important. Mary has chosen the good portion which which will not be taken away from her. In this immediate next instance, from the lawyer to the living room of Mary and Martha, to go and do the same to Mary is doing nothing, who looked more like the good Samaritan? Martha or Mary? Martha, who's serving, who's living out kindness, who's doing something good for a guest, or Mary, who's doing nothing? Who looked more like the good Samaritan? Not Mary. Mary's the opposite of the good Samaritan. Mary's not even walking by. She's just looking at the guy dead on the ground like, okay. She's, She's just sitting there doing nothing while Martha is working. But why was Martha rebuked? Why wasn't Martha rewarded for her kindness and her goodness? Why wasn't Mary rebuked? Listen, if we are going to learn in 2021 what it means to be a good steward of all that God has given to us, we have to understand that what Mary was doing was more important. Mary was focusing on the good portion that will not be taken away from her. We go back to to Jesus and the lawyer. When he told the lawyer, go and do likewise. If the lawyer was honest and transparent, he would have said, I can't. You want me to love like this Samaritan that you just made up? You want me to care for, for everybody in that way and give of my money? I can't do that. I can't love like that all the time. And if he would have said, I can't do that, Jesus would have responded, you're right. You can't. You can't show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness on your own power. You don't have the power to do so. It's impossible. Why? Because we can't be perfect. The next big idea. Showing kindness and goodness is impossible. It's impossible. It cannot be done on our own. When Jesus said, go and do likewise, our typical conclusion is we're going to go out and we're going to try to do this. And it's good, but it's impossible to do it on our own. So then what do we do? How can we grow in kindness and goodness if it's impossible on our own? If we understand what this story was about, it will help us to see this growth naturally. See, when we read the story of the Good Samaritan, it's not about us. The point of the parable wasn't to challenge us to be like the Good Samaritan. We're not the good Samaritan. Who is? Jesus. Jesus was sharing everything that he had done. So who does that make us in the story? We're we're the one who walked down this journey called life, this difficult pathway from one point to another. And we're the ones who were stripped and beaten and left for half dead because of our sin. And the priest and the Levite, meaning the rules and regulations of the law, could do nothing to help us, could do nothing to heal us. It just left us dead on the side of the road, hemorrhaging blood. 
The law could do nothing to bring healing. But then, then we see a man who is despised and rejected by his own people. And when he saw us dead and bloodied on the ground, he came to us. He had compassion. He said, doesn't matter who they are. He came and he stepped down from his animal. He came from his high place to come down to the dirt to help us. He poured oil upon us to soothe us. Oil is representative of, of the Holy Spirit, of, of the calling of God, of the anointing. He pours wine, which is, which is a symbol of the blood that he spilled for us. So it's not just to sanitize the wounds, it's to sanctify us for his use. Then he picks us up and he carries us. He exchanged places with us. He puts us on his animal while he walks. And then where does he go? He goes to an inn. A place of, of rest, a place of hope and healing. And he spends his own resources to care and he spends time to, to love and to bring healing to this person. And the next day, as he continues to give of his resources, his time, he tells the innkeeper, I, I have to go. I have some work to do, but I want you to take care of him. He says to the church, I want you to take care of these people who've been left for half dead on the side of the road. And whatever you do, whatever you spend to care for them, I will repay you when I come back. Jesus is the good Samaritan. Jesus is the one who's coming back for us one day. Jesus was sharing everything that he's done for us. So when he tells the lawyer, go and do the same, and you'll be saved, and you'll inherit, you'll earn eternal life, what he meant was, if you can be like me, if you can be perfect, if you can have my unending grace and compassion and love and peace and joy and patience and kindness and goodness, then you don't need me, but we need him. We need a savior. We can't do it on our own. So the hope that happens here, how we can be all that God wants us to be, no matter who we used to be, is because of all that he's already done for us. And the growth that we're looking for, that we can't do on our own because it's impossible, he shows us how in the next verse. Martha is busy. Mary is just being. Martha is working and trying so hard to see growth and trying of her own strength to make everything good, to be kind. And Mary, she's just simply being present. She's mesmerized by her teacher. She's enamored by his grace. She's hanging on to every word of love that he speaks. And the reason that she chose the good portion that will not be taken away from her is because that is God's greatest gift to us. That is God's greatest present for us. It's his presence. It's who he is. Later on, Jesus is with his disciples and he says, hey guys, I'm giving you a new commandment. I'm God, I'm giving you a new commandment. You know the 10, right? They're like, yeah, we know the 10. He says, here's number 11. In John chapter 13, 34, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And I can imagine him thinking, well, we have that already, right? Because aren't commandments five through 10, isn't that to love our neighbors and to love one another, not steal from them, not covet their wife, not, not want to kill them? Isn't that what loving is? She says, no, here's the new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. There it is. That's, that's how. Just as he has loved us, we love others.
I told us this week one that the purpose of this series really isn't for us to try to get better. It's for us to be more in love with Jesus because he's the only one who makes us better. I want to encourage us of how we can be and the hope that happens here of what our lives can look like, but it's not on our own strength. And so the whole purpose of the series is that right here, where we're at with what we have right now, we can see growth. Our love, joy and peace and patience, our kindness and our goodness can change the world. But we have to know its source. We have to pull from the roots, from the source of life. So many of us, even in this series, if we're honest, we're hearing this and we're saying, I, I can't do that. Last week, so many people were like, man, that was a mean sermon. Holy Spirit was talking to me. You were checking my voicemails like I just have no patience. And you're beating yourselves up over that. You can't do it on your own. You can try. And trying is not bad. Trying is good. It's putting in the work. But unless you understand where it comes from, you're never going to see the fruit. Final thing I want to share with us. Our good works have no power if we don't lean into God's presence. All it is is religion and you listening to sermons and you putting in some action steps, but there's no real fruit and transformation if we don't lean into God's presence. If we've been made alive by His Spirit, let us walk in His Spirit. Let us rest in the love that he has for us and let us lean into the Holy Spirit's power to help us love other people as he lives inside of us.